Well, hello there, folks. Welcome to another update on the situation in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. It is about uh, 4.45 p.m. here, Mountain Standard Time. That would put it at around just before midnight in Iceland. It is December 19th. I did an update earlier today, and so this one will be a, a quick one. Uh, it's been a very busy day uh, for me personally. Lots going on, but all good stuff. And so I don't have a ton of time to spend on this update, but I wanted to briefly go over some new developments and some thoughts I had um, in in the course of today, some things that have transpired over the course of today. So let's get right to it. And I apologize if this is a little more helter skelter than normal. I usually try to organize uh, my updates a little bit more than this, but I think this will work just fine. So I appreciate your patience and bearing with me. Uh, let's start with the Met Office update and dig into this a little bit and so this is the latest update and there's a couple of pieces that we want to focus on here so they put out a new hazard map which i'll get to in a second i'll blow that up and make that uh, much bigger and explain that as best i can um, a little further down though we've got uh, some other information from the met office continued probability of further eruptions so the power of the eruption continues to decrease New images of the area show three vents are currently erupting southeast of Stora Stogafelt, uh, but the fountain used to be five. So we're seeing that original uh, curtain of fire that we saw about this time yesterday has diminished down to just three uh, main eruptive centers along the, that, that fissure system. And that again, that's typical, um, but it's really dropped down considerably over what we were seeing 24 hours ago. Uh, lava has flowed mostly to the east from the volcanoes. So that's good news for good good Indivik because we don't have uh, lava heading to the south. But there is a, also a tongue of lava extending to the west in the to the north of uh, Stora Stogafelt. And I'll show you that on the map here in a second. Um, since the eruption began, around 320 earthquakes have been recorded. Uh, a lot of those, though, were right after the eruption began. Remember, we talked about that fissure extending uh, to the south for sure and probably a little bit to the north. So I'm, I would venture to guess that a lot of those earthquakes have to do with the lengthening of the fracture and the fissure system. Um, and then let's see what else here. Um, Largest one was a 4.1. That's one of the ones we talked about, I believe, yesterday. Uh, and then after that, the seismicities dropped off considerably. And we can look at that here in a second. Uh, today, they've only had 10 earthquakes. So now, again, that the, the conduit system has been established by the magma, there's a clear path for that magma to rise to the surface. We're seeing earthquakes drop considerably. Um, so following the eruption, uh, this is a little bit language translation, um, but... Uh, I'll try to pronounce this a little bit better than I have been. Sindhunukir, uh, Sindhunukir, Giga has sunk by about seven centimeters in Svartsengi, so um, before the land has risen. So I'll show you that on the GPS data as well. So what we're seeing essentially is we've been seeing the inflation taking place as the magma was filling in the subsurface, but now we're actually seeing deflation. So we're seeing some of these GPS stations have actually dropped in terms of their ele elevation. And that's somewhat to, to be expected because you're, you're pumping so much magma from the subsurface to the surface that you'd expect there to be some um, compensation to that change there. Um, Meanwhile, let's see, the, the forest erupts under craters, increased probability of further eruptions. Um, yeah, so if you look at the evil eruption, it took about 90 minutes for the first sign. So um, so they're saying basically with this paragraph, if I'm re reading and translating it right, um, things can happen very quickly. It went very quickly yesterday from no eruption to earthquakes, a swarm of earthquakes, and then actually getting that eruption at the surface. Um, a little bit more information that's important. The power of the eruption continues to decrease. Lava flow is roughly estimated a quarter of what it once was. Um, and original third of the crack is still active. Um, do, 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 do. Anything else here? Um, yeah, just talking about the decrease in activity more or less. Um, they did put out, and I can blow this up a little bit if that's helpful, a, you know, a satellite image showing the extent of the the flow field of the lava field in that area and so hopefully that's a good size right there for you so you can see um uh, Lingerfeld, the hill right here this is the power plant 
right in this area in the blue lagoon you can actually also make out the defensive wall the berm that they constructed shows up pretty nicely here and then another one here uh, and then the yellow lines are the eruptive fissures and then the red indicates the extent of the lava so a lot of the lava from the fissures going to the east uh, and then we've got two tongues or lobes of it moving to the the north or northwest and those were the ones that when i was uh with johan with the nature eye drone last night uh, that's the ones we were closest to that you could see in the foreground um, so this at least nicely shows us uh, the extent of the flow field uh, and that's as of uh, maybe like five or six hours ago earlier today so let's look at that hazard map that they put together um, see if I can find the right link there we go and let me also uh, our good friend Amanda Joe was kind enough to provide me with some translations here so they've got a new hazard map remember previously they had thing in one of four zones and now they've designated six specific hazard zones uh, one over here in orange around the power plant blue lagoon two and three right along the eruptive fissure the vent four is down here around uh, Grindavik in the in the town area five is to the north or northwest I suppose of the eruptive fissures and six is to the southeast and so real quick here as you look at the legend for this and look at all the different uh, designations for the these hazards let me give you a little bit of a translation again provided by Amanda Joe and appreciate her help with that um, so Sprunger those are cracks so basically fractures um, and so that exists for I believe uh, zones one through four these are places where you could get uh, fractures or tension cracks open cracks in the ground um, the uh, I won't try to pronounce some of these because I know I'll butcher them but Gosopnun is uh, well I just tried to pronounce it anyway uh, that's lava fountains so that would be a fountaining of lava and then if they add um, this here I believe that's oh lava fountains without notice so in zone two we've got that as a hazard uh, this term here uh, H-R-A-U-N I know that's Kron and I hope I pronounced that right now that always means lava so this is lava flow uh, and Gasmengun that's gases and then um, let's see what else do we have here uh, this expression here the in the second column over on zone two the middle one there it starts with the H that is hazardous gas pollution and then the final one that we haven't really deciphered here is the one if we look let's see which one is it we've done that one that one maybe we've covered oh and then this one is earthquakes here the one that starts with a J um, Jars Jarth scaffolder I probably butchered it sorry folks um, but that means earthquake so you can see they're, what they're doing is just designating specific hazards in each zone <coughs> excuse me and then the color of the zone indicates sort of the severity from low or little in green uh, to sort of you know medium in orange here and then a uh, high or severe in the purple color there um, and so what's interesting to me is that they've they put the Grindavik area in red um, presumably because it's still aligned with the fissure system and I wonder if they also maybe factored in you know infrastructure and and, and the human component as well I, I don't know that um, but it'd be interesting to know exactly um, you know, all the parameters that went into that so this is just helpful and this is common in any sort of hazard situation is to produce hazard maps revise them and issue those out to the public so they understand what hazards exist in different areas so I found that to be uh, pretty helpful and again thanks to Amanda Joe for the translation on on the terms there otherwise I would have been somewhat grasping in the dark as to what those what those mean um, okay so here's the another map that we've looked at before and um, again I'm doing these possibly in no particular order but we we saw with the previous map you can see the two red lines here that show where more or less the active section of the eruption is taking place so just to the east of Storoskogafelt the this hill here 
and then another eruptive fissure more or less in the middle of the system east of Silingerfelt and so this hill near the power plant those are the two active areas so the good news here is and I mentioned this in the morning update is we're not seeing even though this is the extent of the eruptive fissure uh, last evening this is not erupting now and so we're not seeing as much of much activity on the southern edge of this let me I want to find the right balance of, uh, of zoom here that's maybe a little bit too much so we're seeing areas here and here not much in between and nothing at the south end and that's good uh, I do need to make a correction also over uh, from my previous update this morning I, I looked at the contour lines a little bit wrong here uh, and so this is actually going down so as, as these I, I misinterpreted this contour line here as being higher than this bold contour line which would be uh, I guess 50 meters um, or so is that right yeah I think so uh, no these are these are 20 meters so this would be 80 meters sorry um, so this would be a 84 meter con or excuse me going down 76 meter contour line the point is is that this is a lower area to the east of this fissure and so that's good news my mistake is good news because that allows more of the lava to accumulate in this lower area this morning my mistake was that I thought that was a higher to uh, contour line which meant that the lava couldn't really go uphill here and it would turn and possibly flow to the south but this is in fact a lower uh, contour line and we're not even seeing the eruption here anyway it's actually further up in this region and so again good news so these lava flows are gonna there's a lot of space over here um, we could eventually see some of these lava flows uh, encroach upon some of these steeper hills way over here to the east uh, several kilometers away so that's good news for uh, Grinevik is to have putting more of that lava uh, into this space filling up as much of this space as possible with lava will keep it from potentially moving to the south and so I wanted to make that correction over uh, what I mentioned this morning so and a couple of viewers reminded me of that error so thank you for that um, let's go to let's go to the GPS data because I found this interesting as well and let's pull up the same main graph that we've been looking at and that's the uh, the Svartsengi graph and we'll focus on again this is the uplift graph and so again if you haven't seen these before this is just the land elevation uh, of this specific GPS station near the power plant and so in September stable elevations nothing happening geologically then as we get into late October uh, the dots start to trend upwards and so the land is rising uh, and so the land actually ends up rising maybe uh, 50 millimeter 50 millimeters or so five centimeters and then that all reaches ahead at November 10th when the elevation drops considerably because that magma uh, had moved away from this area and had moved over to the east to fill in the dike which is uh, the area where we have the eruption now so this is this uptick was interpreted as magma inflation magma filling in the subsurface and the whole area kind of rising if you can imagine a, a balloon being blown up it's going to continue to expand and rise or maybe bread rising if that helps um, and then it drops because we get the earthquakes and the movement of the magma off to the east and then since that time around November 10th we've seen this steady uptick in in recovery more inflation of the land or at the power plant and then that culminated of course with the eruption and so there's a big jump there um, in the data but then there's a drop here and again it's only a couple points here but I'm seeing this on several of the other GPS stations so it's not an anomaly and so it would it would seem to indicate deflation so this uptick is um, the magma becoming over pressurized and the eruption basically beginning right about that point and then I would interpret these these lower points as being deflation or de a deflationary trend because now you're erupting some of that magma onto the surface as lava and so you'd expect there to be some um, some collapse or lowering of the land as you take some of that magma that's in the subsurface and transfer it up to the land and so you can see similar if we pick a different one like uh, 
the uh, Eldvorp station, which is a few kilometers to the west. Uh, notice you see the same little trend right here, just above my little little picture there. In fact, I'll, I'll make my little little head thing. Whoops, a little bit smaller, perhaps, if I can. There we go. Yep. So you can see those points there. Again, that drop there. So uh, several tens of millimeters of deflation. So we'll have to see if that continues um, while the eruption is taking place. That would be a characteristic or a trend I would expect to see. Um, but if it starts to creep back up, that may indicate that the rate of magma intruding into the region is exceeding what's being erupted at the surface, which might uh, indicate that the eruption is going to last a lot longer or potentially could increase in intensity. But if this continues to drop, and again, we've only had uh, a couple data points over the last 24 hours, um, then we'll have to see how it goes. We'll just pay attention to that. Um, a couple other things. So there was a couple interesting uh, news stories that came about. And thanks again to Amanda Joe for sending me some of these, some of which I had found, but several of which uh, she found for me. So thank you. So you can actually model this stuff. And so here's a model. The article, I don't think, says who's done this. It just says scientists. So we'll trust that this is coming from a reputable source, but we, there's no, and I don't, I'm not familiar with the uh, Verkis, the company logo at the bottom left corner, but basically what they've done is model the output of the lava flows to show what this might look like moving forward. So what we have here is more or less today, December 19th, you, there's a little timestamp and date at the top right corner. And then you can see the blue lines are the eruptive fissures. And the places where the lava output is greatest is shown in some of these oranges and red colors here. But they're sort of modeling, OK, if this thing continues at the current rate, what will uh, the flow field look like? So they're projecting into the future, maybe a week or so up till Christmas time, how expansive this lava field might be. Um, within a week. And this is important. It's important to model these things, make projections. We're not trying to make a 100% accurate prediction, although th that'd be great if it worked out that way. But we're just trying to model the behavior so we can make good informed decisions, right? No one knows exactly where this thing's going to go. It could shut down, it could ramp up, it could change locations. There's so many variables. But assuming everything stays as it's currently constituted, what would uh, this look like. So you can see the road there in white. So that's the highway. Um, Blue Lagoon power plant over here. And so if we just let this thing play, you can see the expanse of the flow field. So what they're doing is they've modeled the topography. Um, and so they're filling that lava in to the low spaces here. And I'll pause real quick and make one more point and I'll let this run. So again, th several assumptions come into this model. One is the rate of lava output. Um, two is exactly knowing where the lava is going to go because lava, it's not exactly like water. We think it's just going to go downhill and it generally does. But remember that as you, as these lava flows move away from the vents, they're building topography. So they're changing the landscape all the time as the lava field is evolving. So you might get one lava flow. If you've ever seen a lava flow, you know that the leading edge of that flow can be um, not just a few meters in height, it can be several meters, maybe up to 10 meters or more in height. So these, it can form ridges. It's forming its own topography while it's erupting. And so this is just one possible model. But the good news here, according to this model, is that they show the most expansive flows heading to the north, uh, kind of surrounding Stora uh, Stogafelt, this hill here, and not much happening to the south. So the lava field looks like it's expanding to the east but it's stalling out because it's really low topography there and there's just not a lot of uh, lava output in that direction that's the other thing to consider too is as the the fissure and the vents change they can shift and it's kind of like a, a nozzle effect it depends on where you point you know if you have a hose or something if you're pointing the hose to the left you're going to get that area wet if you point it to the right you're going to send the water that way so it, it depends on exactly where the lava is being directed when it erupts from these vents but we'll let this go a little bit further um, so here we are the 23rd of december and assuming again those rates you can see where this thing ends up here we are christmas eve 
um, and then moving forward and now we're into Christmas Day um, and so it does look like we have a good likelihood that the lava flow could cross or get near the road um, so that's a definite hazard and risk at which point it will now they don't have the uh, let me go back a little bit here they don't have the the wall or the berm on here but I believe it kind of comes around right through here maybe that is it right there I can't tell um, so if this model projection holds true there's a pretty good chance that they'll they'll get to test out that barrier because the lava flow will eventually encroach upon and make contact with that lava barrier or that that berm or wall that they put around the power plant and the blue lagoon so um so just an interesting concept and i'm sure these models will continue to evolve and change you could ask another group of scientists to create a similar model and it all ultimately it all depends on the variables you pick and the assumptions you make and so there's quite a bit of wiggle room in these so i, th I thought that was pretty interesting uh, another news story here uh, let's see this one here has to do with they've already grabbed some samples of the lava and I know a couple of people have asked me questions about that so they've had scientists go in sample the lava directly what they do is quickly grab a piece of that lava on a pole or a rock hammer or whatever um, and then they quench it so they'll cool it off immediately because uh, if you let it cool slowly it's composition might change a little bit the crystals are getting larger because it's cooling more slowly what you want to do is quench that lava as quickly as possible so you're basically taking that snapshot um, in terms of the lava chemistry the textures the size of the crystals and what these preliminary results are saying from this geochemist is that the um, uh, that it's quite evolved magma and so without getting into some of the translation stuff here it's not um, what we would call a primitive uh, magma primitive magma would be it came right from the mantle straight to the surface had little to no residence time or period where it stalled and stayed in the subsurface in the crust it went from a deep source to the surface quickly that's not what they're seeing that is what we had seen in some of the previous eruptions but here at this eruption near Grindavik what we're really seeing is that these magmas um, have spent some time underground they they have um, been underground for some period of time and the crystals uh, and the size and the zoning or the the um, crystallization process that took place with each one of those crystals gives them some clues and evidence as to exactly how the um, that magma has evolved and so it suggests that it spent a little more time down in the crust before erupting to the surface and so um, though this is just a, a preliminary result um, this is an old article down here the lava magma shows a direct connection down to the mantle that's from the 2021 eruption um, so anyway so there's some articles there i'll try to remember to link these as well uh, this is another one here from uh, this is a phd student helga and so she's doing some of that research as well so there's a nice article here about her and her research and so she's been out to to sample those as well um, if anyone knows her and as a way I could get in touch with her, that'd be great. I've tried to reach out to her and see if she wants to do a little uh, interview or something where we could get to know her and ask her some questions. I think that would be really interesting. So um, let's see, what else? What else do I have here? Um, well, I didn't even give you this little nugget, I suppose. I, I jumped right in with all the, the information because I was excited. But if you're interested in seeing where things are at, of course, you can pull up these uh, webcams on YouTube as well as I can and so we still have periodic uh, lava fountaining this kind of bursting as these gases these cumulates of gases reach the surface you get these kind of small minor explosions that send this uh, clots and spatter of lava in different directions um, here's a different view um, from a different camera and so you can see again we've got several looks like at least three eruptive vents um, this one on the far right is the one i think we were just looking at previously and so these could go on for again you know uh days possibly weeks maybe longer um, the whole thing could ramp back up a little bit possibly we'll have to see um, 
but lots of different possibilities in terms of how this thing might play out and so um sorry there's a distraction there and so yeah so it still is making a nice spectacle um real quick let's go to my handy dandy google earth um there is a little bit so it is quick review here we've got the town um the orange line is the fissure when it erupted but now i probably could make some new annotations on here and, and i probably will but this area is still active here uh, and then we've got a little bit of one up here that's still active uh, but nothing much at the south end which is good what i was trying to do and i'm sure there's smarter people than me out there that could do this is is if you take this topography and kind of model it there is a bit of a right in here somewhere there's a bit of a what i'd call a drainage divide basically a, a saddle where if you get lava coming out of the south end it's probably going to move to the south but if the lava is a little further up as it is currently it's more likely to flow out this way to the east so there's a little bit of a pass or a saddle or divide that separates this region uh, from this region over here and so i was playing with that a little bit but didn't get time to to put that all together uh, what'll be interesting is most of that lava is spilling out to the east and i think that's primarily because of the winds so we have winds coming out of the west or northwest so as that lava fountains upwards more of it is falling on the east side of the fissures than on the west side and so that's feeding larger lava flows with greater extent off to the east uh, and that's good news i think as well because that that's giving the all this this wide berth in this big area for the lavas to flow if we had more lavas pouring out on this side on the west side uh, that could be problematic because um, the the topography here does bring that down right next to uh, Silingerfeld and then possibly could take it towards the power plant again they've got the the berm built up here um, and if it even even if it ran into the berm it might just uh, parallel the berm come over here to Hagafelt and then it could start to move down this slope here towards the town but we'll have to see that's um, that's a long ways in the future and generally the winds uh, don't come out of the east as much here in in this part of Iceland they're generally out of the sometimes out of the south sometimes out of the west um, lots of different directions but an east wind is, is a little bit more rare so um, I think that's all I've got for this evening update. Um, folks in Europe, it's probably pretty late. You're probably not watching, but you might catch this in the morning. Uh, I'll be sure to get up and see what new, what is new and what's developed and put together another update for you with um, if I feel like there's enough uh, content and substance to provide some insights that are worth your while. So I appreciate you joining me again. Appreciate your support, the encouragement, the kind words. They all just help motivate me um, it's it's fun to share what you love but it definitely helps that when you share what you love to hear to hear that it's appreciated to hear that it's making a difference in people's lives and that's what I am hearing and I'm grateful for that so hope you're well uh, have a good rest of your day evening or morning whatever the case may be and I'm sure I'll see you soon take care and thank you <music>